Welcome to lecture number five. Name is Stefan Eriksson and today in lecture number five of the course Programming for EOR, well, we got a beautiful R screen. We are going for the light version here. So this is what people prefer. I've already set the directory and what are we gonna talk about today? We are gonna talk about some illustrations of the central limit theorem. You hopefully heard about that before, but otherwise a little illustration wouldn't hurt, wouldn't it? How to draw random numbers again. We're gonna visit that again draw some quantiles, make some QQ plots. We're going to look at some distributions overall, and then we're going to look into combinatorics. I really like combinatorics a lot, as you may have noticed. And I know you guys know a lot about it because you did a course on probability theory, a fantastic course. And you also learned a lot of good math, which we are also going to work a little on today. At the end, we're going to simulate a few things again. So we go back to some simulation examples and we are going to have just a teensy tiny quiz show. So before I go any further, let me test something. Let me test whether this is actually working. Hmm. No, that didn't work. I'm gonna try that again later because I got some fun in store for you guys when we're gonna do our little uh, simulation example later. Hopefully I'll make it work at that point. Otherwise, you know what, too bad. It's gonna be fine nevertheless. So let's drive over to our studio. Yes, I know that this is uh, weird looking at the screen because I'm looking this way, even though the screen on here is that way, but uh, please bear over with me. Everything is set up as usual. So we're gonna start with some illustrations of the central limit theorem. We're gonna be first drawing from a nice little binomial distribution. So basically draw with replacement sort of, right? So in this case here, we got P and N and K and B and a number of simulations. We're gonna do this a hundred thousands times. hundred thousands thousands of times. A lot of times, guys, of course. So what we do here, we initialize all our values here. So, okay, we now got that loaded in. That is all nice and fine. Then we set up a nice little matrix here where we're gonna record all the means from this, well, simulation, right? So. When we got a nice little data matrix here, you see now it's empty. We're going to record a lot of observations in here. Nothing we haven't done before. You all know how the binomial distribution works, but we know that the mean is n times p, and we got the variance also here, which is n times p times q, p uh, cubed denoted as 1 minus p. So I'm not denoting any q, I'm just writing 1 minus p. That shouldn't be all out in the wind for you guys. Otherwise, Wikipedia to get these kind of things is not a bad source just to get the brush up. Otherwise, take a trip to Khan Academy if you're not sure. That's a good page. Mm. Didn't sleep too much yesterday. Had to stay up late yesterday because, well, there was a new episode of Walking Dead. So I uh, had to watch that, right? And it was actually kind of a boring episode. So you kind of felt like, oh, damn it. And, uh, and uh, yeah. And an excellent point from Anastasia at this point. Yeah, stack when you don't need to get the code indeed. So um, that is exactly true. But okay, let's run the simulation, see what happens, guys. So we're running a simulation with a nice little for loop. We run from i, from one up until the number that we adjusted for, or the number we initialized, let's, let's be correct here, with 100,000. Each of them, we draw a random number from r bin on, this is me pronouncing all these kind of R functions. So it's drawing random numbers from this binomial distributions. N equal to the B here. So that's a thousand times we're drawing. So for each of these simulations, we are drawing for each simulation a thousand times from this binomial. Uh, sorry. Yeah, that is actually correct. Well, each of the size here are N. Do you see here N? What are the noted N? That is 10. So we draw 10 each of these bins. And with the probability of P. Probability we set for is just 50-50. So imagine that we're just flipping a bunch of coins. That's essentially what's going on here, right? We're just flipping, flipping, and flipping a little more. So let's just do it here. It's going to take a little while, even though how fast my computer is. I should imagine this is the third computer I'm actually doing this course on, right? And when I did it on the first one, it took forever to run the code in class. It was slow and... It got stuck a few times and that was not fun, of course. So now, what essentially happened now? Well, besides I got a better computer in the meantime, so now it ran, it's there, we have loaded it in. We can now draw a histogram to see whether this actually appears normal. Because remember how this whole 
<clears throat> how this whole uh, central limit theorem works. So we have these individually random variables. We draw a lot of them. They will approach, as n gets very large, a normal distribution. Notice here we also conduct a normalization here on line 50. So we normalize this here. It's kind of also what we would call standardizing, right? And notice this formula here. You can always look it up again on your favorite Stack Overflow website if you're not certain how this works. But essentially just, just a standardization or what we would call a normalization of this random variable. Because when you draw a lot, they will have the same mean, but they will not have the same variance. So when you are drawing from such a distribution, this case here, um, let's say it. So all these individual random variables are from the same distribution. Surely this binomial, right? Or let me do it this way up at the screen there, right? And sure, we can't expect to the, the new means have the same, but it does have the same mean. It will have the same mean, but it won't have the same variance. Think of it this way here. So when I make n larger and larger, Actually, now when I want to think about it, you probably had this explanation over probability theory, but it couldn't hurt. Um, so you would get closer and closer to the theoretical probability. It's actually just an illustration of the law of large numbers, right? But you are, in this case, you're recording a sample mean, making more and more observations. And we also know that the more the merrier, haha, the more we draw, the smaller the variance, because the variance defines a sigma square divided by n. And what you notice up here in line 50, now let me point the right way. It's annoying my screen is over here, but you will probably see me point this way to get up on the screen here, but you have got it so far. We're five lectures in, right? So you see here now that we have taken the square root of these things here, because this is for the variance. Square root of variance is the standard deviation. That shouldn't be such a biggie. And of course, just rewriting this here as well, because you take the square root of this here. And you also get the square root of this. So I could just rewrite this and put this below as well. But this is just a rewritten case here. Otherwise, we just take the mean we draw, subtract it from the theoretical mean. Look it up, C-score formula, for instance. But okay, enough about that. Does it actually look normal? You should see a little plot here. Hopefully, it is uh, nice. I would just, by just looking at this here, I'll be like, that seems normal enough for me. But what characterizes a nice normal distribution? What do we know about this? We know that it should have a skewness of zero, or of standard normal, sorry. Uh, so let's call in this library for moments so we can use these moment functions to be precise, skewness and kurtosis, kurtosis measure of peakiness. If I'm not mistaken, we're talking about the third and fourth moment of such a distribution. By from the simulation here, we get a skewness of practically zero, it's very close. We get a kurtosis of something very close to free. If I would increase the sample size even further, we did 100,000 this time. If I would increase it even further, we'll probably get even closer to this. But at the fear from this taking very long and running very slowly, I'm just gonna stick at 100,000. That's usually enough for simulation purposes, but I could just stuck it up and do a million, right? You can try it out. The lecture script should be on Nestor. So please confirm if you have found the lecture screw of Nestor, otherwise I would have to upload it. I promised you guys it would be made available before the lecture, but if I'm not wrong, it should be up there. Okay. Hmm. Ah, so Yannick, this is also, uh, I appreciate your question. So to read out, um, oh, and thanks for confirming it's there. So indeed it's there. Yannick, he has a question. He opened my lecture script and I'm trying to run the codes myself. But in the console, the, the let's say the greater sign is, is replaced with a plus. That is something to do when you don't run the last little bracket here, you see. So if I would only run these lines here, it will keep appearing with a plus up here until you close the bracket, say in line 53. So you actually try just to run the entire chunk of code in one go like this here, including the closing curly bracket. Then you should not have this problem in your, uh, in this case, in your console. That should hopefully help you on this one. I've done it many times myself. Also, the first time I taught this, this was stupid because I was just sitting like, what the hell is happening there? Looking all weird and funny, but okay. Mm. I do not get why that is the case because I do, I do understand your question, Yannick. So you still have the problem, but uh, uh, otherwise, I do have support from Diego to take on this one here while I will continue. 
but I'm pretty sure that is the case, Yannick. I'm, I'm actually pretty sure. But if it still persists, please don't hesitate to contact me. Cup of coffee? Mm. What I was going to say, a way we can check whether something is still normally distributed, guys, is to draw a QQ plot. You hopefully heard about those before. So what we are essentially doing, we're plotting the theoretical quantiles against, well, I would call it the practical quantiles. Um... Now, Yannick, let me know if it works out. I'm just referring to the chat, guys. So if it's a little weird what I'm just saying here, just refer to the chat here. But if you're watching this back on YouTube, it's it's weird because there's no chat. But we got a question about this code here. I'm happy it seems for Yannick it's working. Fantastic, Yannick. I'm very happy to hear that. So about this QQ plot. We are plotting the theoretical quantiles against basically, well, I'll call it the practical quantiles for lack of better words. So... Let's wait a little tiny bit here. And hopefully what we will see, ah, that is beautiful, isn't it? It's a straight line, as straight enough in the sense that look here, this here should represent or should tell us that what we're drawing here actually appears to be normal. So from the histogram, from the skewness and kurtosis, but also the QQ plot, a normal QQ plot to be precise. Not so bad, guys. That is done on line 67 and 68. But the question now persists. What if we didn't normalize? We normalized on line 50 up here, where we subtracted the mean divided by the standard error. Or to subtract the mean divided by, yeah, 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 I can do this. And now, what happens if we didn't? Let's try without. Let's try and see what happens. So I'm going to run exactly the same again, the same little loop here. So let's put a new matrix. So let's basically empty the old one. Ah, itchy eye. Whoopsie, guys. And we run a new for loop, same way as before, just without this normalization. So we're just drawing from this, these random numbers from this binomial distributions, i.e. we're flipping, a, in this case with a 50-50 probability, we're flipping a lot of coins. It's good we didn't have to do this uh, on our own. So now it's running, as you can see in the console. Just give it a second, and it'll hopefully be there. I fingers crossed that it will run. It is done. Fantastic. Good computer. You deserve a pit. There we go. So question is, does it look normal? We put a new histogram and see what happens, guys. So what we get here, I look at it, and I'm like, normal enough to me. So ha. what actually happens here? Well, this is just an illustration of the law of, sorry, central limit theorem. I'm always messing those two up. So we drew a lot of times from this distribution. And of course, when you draw all these different random variables, you draw enough times, they will converge to, well, a normal distribution under certain conditions. But let's just look at also skewness kurtosis. Yeah, yeah, they're pretty close, pretty close to zero for skewness. So whether it's skewed to either left or right, doesn't seem to be. It's actually definitely neglectable. It practically zero. And the kurtosis is the measure of, say, peakiness. Well, the peak, as we have here, around three. Not too bad. I'm actually, well, very happy about this. And what we can see here, let's try the QQ plot again. What I also, I put in some comments here also just to illustrate, hey, guys, this is what happened. So when you look back at the, this here, you can, of course, with the support of the video, but you can also just check out the script. What we see here, it's actually a normal QQ plot, but there's a small difference here. It is not a... It's not like going through Origo per se. It has, well, in this case, it's not Y times X. So it's not just, you know, a 45 degree line going through Origo. No, it's still this 45 degree line, sort of. But we now have an alpha here, or we have an intercept. So it's like moved a little bit. But nevertheless, looking at this QQ plot, that appears to be normal. Again, just an illustration of the central limit theorem. So sip a coffee, go to the next bit. You know, this is a good moment to ask you guys. There's going to come a question up here. Is the pace okay like this? Trying a little differently. Also, just, you know, we learn as we go. Still new to all this here. Sort of, right? So I'm still... I just want to hear you guys, is this okay? Let me know. Put the box up here. It's also good to hear some feedback for you guys. Thanks for answering. Oh, that is a lot. Already more than 20 votes. That is very, very quick. Thanks, guys. I will take this as a grand success. And uh, 
let's carry on. We got a lot to uncover yet, and we got a lot of cool examples coming up. So thank you very much for uh, responding back on this. We hit 30 already. So this is very, very, very good. I got a question from Silke. So why would we normalize it? So there's many reasons why. And well, the easiest explanation, just look up in your statistics book on this one here. But just to go a little over Silke's question here. So in this case, it's not normalized. No, it's not. Oh, let me remove the poll first. Thanks for answering the poll, guys. So why did we normalize in the first case? Well, it's also to compare comparison of scale. For instance, when you, let's take an econometric example, because next week we're going to do a whole lot of regressions. When you want to compare apples and oranges, it says, or things of two scales, you can normalize them or standardize them to make them comparable. So everything is measured in standard deviations. What you normally would do when you normalize things like this here, you are kind of, lack of better word, you're making it normal. That sounds so mean saying it this way. But what you're essentially doing is you're converting to the same scale, comparable scale. Not going to go much in that here. That is not what we're here for, but I hopefully this would put some insight here. Otherwise, just normalization. There's a lot out there. It's good to know. But now what we're doing here, we're just illustrating the central limit theorem. Let's close this one down. But like I said a few minutes ago, under certain conditions. One condition is the variance have to exist. Let's see what happens if it doesn't. So I put a note here that it doesn't work if the variance doesn't exist. And let's just try it out. I'm going to put a new matrix up. So we do the same as before. Put a nice little matrix to store all these means that we are recording. And now we're drawing from a coffee, uh, coffee, coffee distribution. Yes, we are drawing from a coffee distribution, guys. It's actually a Cauchy. So basically, I don't know how much measure theory you guys have, if anything, or metric spaces. But typically, when you have a Cauchy distribution, it's basically when you draw dots, doot, 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 and they become closer and closer, for instance. It's one way of explaining. You can also see this as a strict contraction, if the mapping is a strict contraction. And if you're in a perfect metric space, blah, 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 you have a fixed point theorem. Ah, that was just Banach's fixed point theorem. Doesn't it matter here. We are drawing from this... <clears throat> coffee distribution. And the thing about this distribution here, the variance doesn't exist. So what happens if the variance doesn't exist? We're waiting for the simulation to be done. It is done. Fantastic. Well done, computer. Another pet for you. There we go. And we look at the histogram. Guys, I don't know about you. That don't look normal to me. That is <laughs> abnormal, or just let's just say not normal. That's not really what we want, right? So that's the first hint that this is not going the way we're supposed to be. Let's look at skewness and kurtosis. Should it be zero and three, right? Let's look at these beautiful graphs and beautiful numbers. Skewness, yeah, that's very skewed as you may have seen. Hmm. Kurtosis, very high. Certainly not normal, but there's one more thing we can do. We can, of course, also just make the same QQ plot. So we're drawing these quantiles against the theoretical normal quantiles. What happens now, guys? That, cur that curve took a nap. It flat down, horizontal, took a nap. It actually looks like a nice little place to take a nap instead, right? So, yeah, that is not normal because had it been normal as before, it would have represented a nice horizon not horizontal. I want to say horizontal the whole time, but I mean a nice 45 degree line. That didn't happen here. So, no normal normality, certainly. As noted also in the script here. So far, so good. Let's carry on. We still got some ways to go. I've noticed one more thing about when you lecture online compared to when you lecture offline. It typically goes a lot faster lecturing online. As you notice, I rarely use all the time here, but that's also because normally raise questions with the class, walk around, take your, well, take your time and whatnot. You could do the same here, but just when you lecture online, it's just a little different because, well, trying interaction, but it's a little less, but it's just different. But so far, so good. Keep the pace the same, see how it goes. We have a few more things to do. The next thing here is so now we illustrated the central limit theorem a bit and see when it worked and when it didn't work. Now, let's look at drawing random numbers from different distributions. You've done this before, but this is just a good way to illustrate it because you may need it sometime very soon, guys. Assignment 5 is online already, so keep that in mind. 
Let's set B at, in this case, just 10,000. You know what? Let's just clean up everything here. I like it nice and clean, not needing it anymore. Anyway, so let's draw 10,000 numbers from a uniform distribution. R unif, right? And we put a histogram already. We encapsulate this in the histogram already, so we don't have to do this in two lines. We can just do a one-liner. Whether this is good style or not, please confront the style guide, guys. So look at this here. That is nice, uniform. And if you don't specify anything, the default is between 0, 1. In this case, the open interval. So just to complete besides the question, guys, can you count all the numbers in the open interval between 0 and 1? Is this, in other words, countable? Are you able to put attach a number here that is less than infinite? In other words, is this countable? Anybody who knows that? Just uh, besides the little extra fact here, picking again from measure theory. God, I love that course. And um, the answer here is indeed no. If I would, on the other hand, change to the closed and bounded interval between 0 and 1, so change these to square brackets, it is indeed countable. But indeed, thanks you guys for responding to this. This is not countable if it's the only interval, but that's besides the point. Let's draw from the normal distribution instead. We're drawing random numbers from a normal distribution. We see a nice little bell shape here, don't we? It looks nice, pretty. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, and we can also, of course, same principle. We can also draw from an exponential distribution. We can also draw from a Poisson. We can draw from our little coffee distribution from earlier. We can draw from, well, geometric, hypergeometric. We can draw from so many different distributions. Well, forget the last ones. Now we just focus on this here. We're going to come back to this. Now we can, of course, draw from normal here. Mean 7, standard deviation 5. Of course, when we don't set anything, default is 0, 1. But again here, now we just draw 10 numbers. As you can see on the screen of the console here, we just drew 10 numbers from normal distribution. I'm just illustrating some quick examples. These are not the most sophisticated things we're doing in this course. And if you're asked to do these things, well, maybe you are. If not in the assignment, maybe in an exam. Who knows? Well, I do, but I'm not telling you right now. But uh, there's a reason for the madness here, right? So, and we can also draw here from the, well, binomial distribution. Probability again, 0, 5. And you see again here, same as before. So, okay, nothing too bad. Um, I got a question here from uh, Anastasia regarding the exam. It's not that I'm neglecting answering that now, but I'll wait to the end of the lecture if that's okay. Then we will discuss a little more about the exam. I'd like to tell a little more about it, but we're also, of course, going to have a nice little Q&A session before the exam where I'm, of course, going to go through the details. But I can already tell you a few things. And uh, I want the first hint. It's not as long as the assignments. I swear. Okay. With that said, let's carry on. We got a lot to cover still. Or a few fun things to cover. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. So, yay. Okay. Let's carry on with some quantiles of the distribution. We all... You hopefully dealt with some hypothesis testing. So some of these numbers that pops up may seem familiar to you. If not, they will be soon. Especially when we look at the, say, 1% significance level, 5% significance level, and 10% significance level. So we know also when we look at a normal distribution, we know also this should be a 1.96. We've seen this number before. And remember, normal distribution is symmetric. So I can draw from both ends. So whether I draw lower end or upper end, so to speak, get the same number just, you know, without the plus minus. So in absolute terms, they're the same. And of course, we can also draw from this quantile here instead. So this is the one we will get, say, the level for, say, uh, what do you call it, 10% significance level. We can also look at the 1% significance level. So these here, 5, 10, and 1. These numbers will come back to you again and again. I'm just showing, draw, I'm just drawing a lot of different stuff from you here, just to show that we can draw also from um, yeah, how to say it, we can draw quantiles and later I'm also going to draw from the PDF and the CDF. So wait a little for that one. But before we go to PDF and CDF and these kind of things, well, PDFs you're great at because you know how to knitter. Oh, wait, that's not the same, right? Haha. <laughs> now, so we can, of course, also use this to draw some confidence intervals around here. So the formulas presented here, we have a mean, we have a sigma, we have an n, so a number, right? Well, the number of observations essentially. And of course, we can just 
attach around this mean of 83, we can draw this confidence interval. And you can see here, we choose to do this one at the 5% level on each side. So we see there's a lower bound here and an upper bound here around this value of 83, which we have on line 183. Wow, that was totally a coincidence, by the way. And then we can see 188 and 189, 89 attaches these confidence intervals around this number. So, okay, like I said, I'm not gonna spend too much time. I'm just showing some illustrative examples here to see how this has been, how this can be conducted in R. It's also why R is, R is usually used for this for also when it comes for like simulations like we do here, but definitely also just the statistical software package. When I first learned R, my course back in Denmark, my university was called uh, statistics simulation, which means statistical simulation. So just a simulation course, essentially. And it was all about drawing from distribution, simulating different plots and whatever. Was I good at it? No. Did I pass? Sure. But okay, that was, it was a tough one. Let me adjust this one a little bit, guys. There we go. So, so far, so good. Let's carry on for the next thing, because I already said we draw from uh, PDFs. Wow, I call it PFD and PDF there. Should we? Let's correct it. There we go. So first of all, knowing what is what when we draw from what. So when we attach this number here from the PDF, you remember that, of course, from the CDF to go to the PDF, you take the differential. And of course, the other way around, we integrate over the area under the curve, but not the topic of this course, but this is just statistics. So of course, here we get actually likelihoods, not probabilities. We all know that getting a certain value or the absolute likelihood is equal to zero. So the probability or sorry, likelihood of drawing exactly one number on a normal distribution is zero. For explanation, any statistics book will tell you, or there's also fun YouTube videos about this. Maybe I spend way too much time on YouTube watching videos. And of course, we can also look at the cumulative distribution function, which tells you from minus infinity up to this number, what is the probability that you take a value at that number or below, right? So we draw here from 196 and here we get a probability. You see the probability of hitting a value 1.96 or below in this case here tells you here it is, well, 0 0.97 and a half. And of course, if it's a two sided thing, we draw from both ends, then you add, you can simply just double this and you get this 5%. Why am I relating to this the whole time? This because when you do a two-sided hypothesis test, for instance, you're doing your rejection on both sides. So this is essentially what's going to happen later. And again, thanks for joining the chat, Diego. Good morning to you too. So this is just, we're just at the PDF and CDF, as you may have seen. What we can see here, <clears throat> we can, of course, attach, well, name to this object here. We draw a sequence here. Back to lecture one, don't forget. This may be important again later on. We draw from minus four to four with an increments of zero, one. We have here an X, so we see here we have this. We can also just print out X here. Then we get it up in our console like this here. So we can see here from minus four to four. Now, if I then put these numbers into this, well, density function here, so D norm, we see here that I can draw it and whoop to do we get a nice smooth bell shape well, because I put the plot type here to be line. When I do it here for the binomial here later on, I use a different plot type with these bars instead. But you can also generally see that this looks nice and normal again, as it should. So we can, of course, also just from 0 to 50 in x again, plot x against this density from the binomial distribution. In this case, we're not flipping a coin. If this is a coin flip, it's definitely rigged because it's only one third. And we also put a nice little label on it here, as you can see over here, the binomial probability density function. Okay, guys. So, oh yeah. From what you know, of course, probability density function refers to when the, when the distribution is continuous. And of course, when we have, it's uh, the equivalent counterpart over in the discrete world is just a probability mass function, of course. Don't forget those things, but hey, not something you're being tested on here objective here is to program things like that. So you can also apply all this theory from other courses into your programming, right? That is the whole point here. R has a variety of different commands from which you can draw from here. You see P norm, D norm, Q norm, R norm, whatever you wish to do, 
R has a lot. Also for different distributions as already said. I'm out of coffee, need more, need more. What time is it? It's 35 at this point here. So let me see what we have. We have combinatorics now. So I think at this point here, it's uh, there's a nice little break in between now. Um, let me see. Let me ask something for everyone here. Oh, I can't spell. Sorry for the interruption here, guys. I am just uh, asking whether, do you want to break now or should we just wait for the next section, right? So now I'm at a little, little pause point right now, which uh, we're going to start with combinatorics. But should I just carry on or should we have a break? So majority decides. I'll let everybody cast a vote for in a little bit here. Then everybody watching this back, it's fun, right? So voting, woo, we are nice and democratic here. If it lands on 50-50, I will find a coin and flip myself, guys, just so you know. That would give an excuse for me to draw out a nice little coin and uh, flip. Whatever excuse I can get, right? So we're now at 30 votes. That's about the same. With a slight majority here for carrying on. Carry on, my wayward son. Ha, 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 ha. Terrible reference to bad jokes. You're at the right spot, guys. I can do all these bad, bad jokes now. He. <laughs> Hmm. Sipping coffee and um, slight majority guy, majority rules. We will carry on. So let's finish the poll and carry on. We're now going to go to combinatorics, guys. And you know everything about this because you had a nice course on it. But let's just, uh, I've taken the liberty and actually writing this out quite a bit. So now we're going to play the lottery, assuming it's not a tax on the poor. So let us turn to sampling without replacement here, right? So we are simply drawing balls from a lottery bag or something like that, right? We have 40 different numbers and we're gonna sample five. What is the probability that in this case here, you get five numbers correct? Well, you know from the first one, it's one out of 40. We know when we draw the next time because it's without replacement, it's one out of 39. 1 out of 38, 1 out of 37, and 1 out of 36. You multiply all this, you get a very small number, and that is essentially your chance of winning, which we have here in this case here on line 249. You don't need to tell me that this number I have on my console is incredibly small. But there's one thing here. I am assuming here I drew here the perfect sequence. That means that the five numbers I choose here are drawn exactly in one correct sequence. However, when you're playing the lottery, for instance, it doesn't matter which order you get these numbers in, as long as you get the numbers, right? So you have to kind of take that into account. So we kind of have to figure out what is the complete space of probabilities here, and what are all the different combinations that yields this, you know, these five numbers. So we kind of have to account for all those. So you see here, we still have the product, from 40 to 36, well, this is, well, yeah. 1 over 40 times 1 over 39, all the way down to 1 over 36, like we just had. But now, of course, we also have 5 factorial, because these represent all the different combinations of these numbers here. So 5 factorial, as you know, is 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. That's already quite a big number, right? So... We could just write five factorial, or you can just also say five times four times three times two times one, and see that it's 120 different combinations from which you can actually win. That's already a lot better, but the probability, I don't need to, spoiler alert, but you already knew this, it's already rather small. You see, the number did increase comparing these two outcomes here, surely, but well, e to the power of minus six. That's still an incredibly small number. So, well, somebody is winning sometimes. That's fine. But one thing you can notice here, uh, there's another way of arriving at this number. You can also use the choose function. Ugh, I need more coffee. I'm so tired. Sorry, guys. Hmm. We can also use the choose function. You've seen this before, but let's use it here. It's just called choose. So what it actually means, you are choosing 
all the different combination of these five numbers from a whole set of 40. That's essentially what's going on here. So using this here, which is definitely shorter and much easier to use, would and should yield exactly the same number. It will tell you all these different combinations, right? So one over this here, we get this incredibly small number. So, okay. You can simply also just, I put some notes here, which I think is very interesting and useful. On line 272 in the script, 273, 274, it's simply just an example of the hybrid geometric distribution. If you don't know the hybrid geometric distribution, you're in for a fun ride. So what it actually is, you probably heard in probability theory, I sure hope. Please let me know, did you actually cover the hybrid geometric distribution in the course probability theory? I don't know. Please let me know in the chat. I would like to know. But what it essentially is, it's a binomial without replacement. That's the simplest way I can put it. And I got uh, answers back. It's a yes. So that's good. That means this should be nothing new. You should be like, ah, that's easy. So, but what we can do here, we can, of course, just draw this from a hypergeometric distribution. Using this here would yield this exact same probability as we have here. What we're doing, we're choosing of the five numbers we want. We want all five when we draw. We want none of the other 35. So we're multiplying this, dividing by this 4 over or 40 over 5, which represents, well, all the different possibilities of this here. And this here is an example of the hypergeometric distribution, how we write up this. So essentially, it's free choose functions. Simple. You can, of course, extend this also to the, now I can do this, multivariate. That was the word. I somehow always call it multinominal, but it's multivariate hypergeometric distribution. We're getting to the really long names here, right? But fun fact, this is exactly the same chance of drawing Exodia in your opening hand when you're playing Yu-Gi-Oh, for instance, which also comes to show that if you, this is assuming, of course, you play one of each of the Exodia pieces. And need to say, every time that happens, you have to go like, no, Exodia, <sighs> something like that, right? Insert all the cartoon references here, right? So you could actually, this here, it's assuming you have one of each piece that's exactly the same, so you can see how unlikely it is to draw this in your opening hand, assuming you have no other cards to play. But of course, you can also, I put an exercise here for you guys to do. It should be simple when you know it already. We can extend this using the multivariate hypergeometric distribution to say, okay, what if you're playing three of each Exodia piece instead of one? How much will your chance then increase? I also put a nice little link on my channel here. I also cover the hypergeometric distribution in a, let's be frank, a much better game than Yu-Gi-Oh. Uh, this is totally my opinion, by the way, and I'm of course referring to Pokemon TCG, which I believe is a much better, better game than Yu-Gi-Oh. You can of course use the hypergeometric distribution over there as well. Simply just another application of combinatorics. Don't know uh, whether you know this, but you can also do this for poker, obviously. That was one of the first applications. I took this application over the world of Pokemon CCG, and I wrote up an example for you guys here, also referring on line 319 to my episode one, where I actually explained on my channel. I also go for the choose function, so if you need to know more about this, you can just go and view it there. Additional, I'm not gonna go further on it here, but it actually covers, I think enough, in a very user-friendly manner, in my opinion. Let me know, you can always put it in the comment section below. But the example I put up here, in a Pokemon card deck. And yes, I've always dreamt about doing this in teaching. So here's a deck of Pokemon cards. What we are essentially doing, you're trying to get the probability of here getting a mulligan. What is a mulligan, you may ask? That is when I draw my opening seven cards, I do not have a basic Pokemon. To use the childhood reference or whatever, you're not drawing a Pikachu, you're not drawing a Pitchy, you're not drawing a Charmander or whatever they're called. I do not know all the Pokemon, there's way too many of them. But you're essentially drawing your opening hand in a game of Pokemon cards. And what is the probability that you do not get anything? And this is can be calculated using the hypergeometric distribution. Simple as I have here. Suppose you pay 10 of such basic Pokemon in your 60 card deck, you draw 7 cards. And what is the chance that you have none in here? You can calculate this here as the probability, well, of approximately 26% if I've rounded to a whole number, but to be more precise, it's actually 
86% chance that this actually happens. Yeah, I don't even know how many Pokemon there are out there now to referring to the comment from Anastasia here. I have absolutely zero clue. There's probably more than 800, right? And shit ton of episodes. Yeah, well, I can't say anything. My wedding was Pokemon themed. My daughter's name is Avi. You can probably see where this is going, right? So, uh, yes, I'm a fan. I'm not ashamed of it. I wrote my bachelor thesis on it. I have, come on, look at the topic of this whole thing here. So, it's uh, it's basically like this. Thanks, Anastasia, for this year. So, yeah, these are just some fun facts, right? So, ah, this is uh, this is great. Uh, ah. Well, I got to travel all the world for this year. So yes, I travel across the land searching far and wild. And yes, I'm displaying trophies here in the back here. As you can see, these are all Pokemon trophies, for instance. But enough about that. Let's go back here because now um, I could take a small break now, but now I'm not even going to vote. We're just going to continue and finish early. That sounds like a great idea. It's also less editing for my brother when he edits this afterwards. It's fun when people are watching this back on YouTube. But now you have it right there. Well, if you want to see more applications, it's all on the channel under the series Pokemath. There we can see all these kind of things. And uh, well, if you like it, let me know. I, I certainly enjoy doing it in my free time. So, okay, we got some more simulations to do. I'm going to show you two. The first one is plain and simple. Let's uh, plain and simple first. So we're just going to look at the expected value calculation of throwing a die. And no, we're not throwing any D20s or whatever when you're playing D&D. Uh, &D. We're just throwing a nice, let me come with an example here, a nice D6. Just like this one, for instance, guys. This is a nice D6. This one is made of amethyst and it's very, very expensive, so I shouldn't really uh, destroy it or anything. My wife got a nice little set here as well, so that's cool. Bought this when I was at Espiel Esse, when that was still a thing in our pre-corona world, right? So uh, that's that seems like a lifetime ago. Uh, if any anybody who ever been there, you can always find me at a Dragon Shield booth. But that's a complete different story. We are now throwing a lot of dice, and we're going to check simply by using a little for loop here, running it ten thousand times. We are filling out our dice matrix here and see what the mean and variance is here. And well, this is essentially just again when you throw a lot of dice, it should well as the number goes larger and larger, you should converge to the theoretical average, right? Application of the law of large numbers. Another episode of Pokemath if you want to find it on the channel. Wow. So what we do here, we can simply just simulate this here. And you see here, we know that the theoretical mean from 1.6 is 3.5. And, and the simulated mean that we get here, um, the simulated mean we get here is 3.5495. It's close. And if indeed, let's just uh, let's just put another zero on this. Boop and see whether this comes even closer. Let's run this again. It takes a little while. And now you see we go 3.5015. It got even closer because, well, you saw, we increased the number. And here's just the law of large numbers doing its work. This is fantastic, guys. So I am at a point now where I want to test a little thing with you guys. Um, so now I have to see whether this uh, is actually working. I would very much love that this will be working. So let's see. Let's see if it's working now. There we go. We're going to get a little game music in the background because now we are time for the Monty Hall. Right? So let's just go this here. We are going to play a little game. Should I lower the music a little bit? Maybe a little loud. Let's do this. So let's do this. So there we go. Should be a little loud now. We're going to adjust the music. You can all. There. So now we have a little game music to set the mood here. So we are going to. Have fun with the Monty Hall problem. So for those of you who do not know this, we are now at a game show. And I will now play the host. Usually in class, I would uh, ask a student to uh, join me up here. But well, that's a little different here. I cannot. Uh, it's a 
very, very classical issue. So in my little game show, I have this playing three doors. Imagine three doors, one, two, three, right? I need a whiteboard here in the back, that would be nice, but I don't have one right now. So behind each of these doors, there's, let's put something here. There's a, uh, behind two of them, I put a goat. Bah, just a, what we represent, not a great prize. But behind the third door, randomly distributed, of course, there's a super nice Ferrari, Lamborghini, whatever, the dream car you want. I don't know which one I would want, actually, but that's a completely different story. Uh, but let's imagine it's the car of your dreams behind one of these doors. Now, and the thing is here, I will now ask you to select one of these doors. After you selected one of these doors, I will then go and open one of the other doors displaying a goat. And I'll give you the choice. Do you want to stick with your initial choice of door before we open it? Or would you like to switch? And the whole point is here, what are you supposed to do as a contestant? Which one would give you the highest chance of winning? And guys, this is important because you are gonna do this in the assignment. You're gonna generalize this problem in the assignment a lot. And so I really, really, really want to go through this here. So this here represents the classical issue of this or the classical scenario. We set the seed here so we can replicate the randomness. And let's set up a few things. Let's empty out this here so we can see what we get. What we get here is as follows. We are gonna do this 100,000 times. We're gonna have different matrices here to show what's happening. We're gonna record the number of successes in the matrix. If you do not change, I suppose you as a contestant will not change. And now we also record the successes if you change. And we also record all the outcomes on our simulation so we can kind of, you know, confirm. So let's set up all these matrices here. One, two, three, they're all down here. As usual, nothing new there. Now we come to the actual simulation itself. I'm gonna run the simulation first and then explain what's going on because then I can run in the meantime here. So first, and this is nicely written in Dutch, I'm so proud of myself here. Also because the Danish letters don't really conform here. So I can also just write in English, but hey. First, we sample a door from which behind we're gonna hide the car. Totally a small car, right? Then the next one will simulate your choice. Then of course we will simulate what the hell is left after, you know, your choice and where the car is. And then we say, okay, if what is left is only one, that is assuming for instance, you did not pick the one with the car or the one with, you have an if else condition here, which states which one of the doors I as a host would open. I would always open a door, one of the other doors you didn't pick where a goat is depicted. And then of course, we would then see now what is left. And then we see how many successes you would get, you as a contestant, if you switched or if you did not switch. So that is the whole point here. We can of course look at this outcome matrix first. So I'm just looking at the first 10 simulations. So to go over it once again, the first column will show behind what door the car is. Column number two represents your choice. So look at the first one. The car is behind door number two. You choose door number three. I as a host will open door number one and say, there's a goat. And then the other door that will be left at this point that you did not choose would be two. So based on this here, would this be a success for switching or not? As we can see here, success change would record that if you would change in the first instance here, it will be a success. In the second uh, uh, instance here, the second run of simulation, it would not be a success if you change. So of course, if I put here the success no change, they should kind of boom, 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 be opposite of each other, of course. And now this little example here, the question would then be, what is your probability of success for changing versus not changing? People who don't know this problem will go like, yeah, but that's 50-50, right? Because you're choosing between two doors, so might as well flip a coin. But as also said in the chat here, the correct answer here should be switch, 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 always switch. And this nice little video that I linked to here also kind of shows this a lot more. But let's see what is the average chance of success if we don't change and change. Well, any guesses? 
I just want to hear and I guess and answer in, in a chat first before I actually uh, run line 422 and 423. Just to let you guys know. Meanwhile, I'm going to take a sip of coffee. No answers yet. Aha. Uh -huh. So, oh, I got, um, uh, sorry for Supermax here. It's because it records really, really uh, weirdly, but I can see your answer here. And everybody here, of course, you either know this problem or you ran the code. And of course, my thing is stupid for spamming symbols, but I can see your stuff. So don't worry, even if your chat says remove, I can still see it on my account here. So don't worry about it. I can see that you all are correct. Let's run it and see what we get. In this case here, sure, it is theoretical, it should be one third for if you do not switch and two thirds if you switch, saying that you have a higher chance of success if you switch the doors, which is fantastic. So that is what you should do. You can, of course, illustrate this with even more doors to kind of, you know, expand this whole mass here and show this even better. But you know what, guys? This is how this goes. Let's take away this game music. I love it. It's fun, but um, it's more fun to do in class. But, you know, we do the best we can under these circumstances, teaching in the online world. Showing all this, what have we done so far? We showed some central limit theorem. When does it work? When does it not? We also looked a little at, let's go through it quickly again. Send illustrations of the central limit theorem. We looked a little at random number drawing again, like we did earlier. Oh, and we have here that we have quantizing distributions. We drew from the PDF and CDF just so you can see how that's done in R. And of course, we did a lot of competence orgs, one of my favorite uh, subjects. I think it's super cool. And then, of course, we ran two simulation exper examples here, which was five and six if you count for the whole course. Simple expected values. And then we did the Munchie Hall well, problem, from which you guys also will be asked to work with in this week's assignment if you haven't started already. With this note here, I would like to officially close this lecture and say thank you very much for your attention. And until next time. <laughs>